Hi, this is Nayetta, and you're listening to The Health Show. To The Health Show. And you're listening to The Health Show. And you're listening to The Health Show. The Health Show is a podcast dedicated to connecting individuals to mental health resources in the community. The Health Show is more than a podcast. It is a movement focused on change. Our objectives are to change the perception and visible stigma associated with mental health, remove barriers to mental health resources, address the needs of the underserved and challenges that face when attempting access to mental health resources, spread awareness on how to access mental health resources in the community, and encourage those with mental health diseases to seek help. The Help Show founder, Nyetta Reynolds, hosts part two of the first Coffee and Conversation Virtual Life podcast addressing how to maintain mental health while social distancing. Our co-host, Dr. Kent Rogers, and special guest, Michelle McCamey, New York City Director of Home Care and Hospital Admissions for Health Pro, join our virtual live podcast to answer your questions about health and safety during the novel coronavirus pandemic. Michelle McCamey spoke with us about care for the elderly and those with compromised immune systems, as well as ways to stay engaged with people who need us the most. In part one, link to the other video, the Help Show discuss how to practice social distancing and how to manage stress for you and your children. In part two of the month's episode, learn more about maintaining relationships with friends and family, how to protect yourself from coronavirus, and tips to help your children cope with their stress while you are also under pressure. This podcast addresses how to manage your mental health care needs based on recent lifestyle changes, use telemedicine to meet your physical and mental health care needs, avoid the spread of novel coronavirus, support the elderly and others in your community with compromised immune systems. But what about when you walk your dog or you walk your kid, you know, you walk with somebody and you go outside and you come back inside. What's the the proper protocol when you come back from outside? So, you know, germs. Let's say that the guy um, that called about Monty, let's say he, you know, I don't know, he reached out to shake your hand and you didn't think about it because this whole social distancing is new and you shook his hand. Um, <laughs> don't touch your face. <laughs> oh, man, that was my next move. The first thing that I can tell you is don't touch your face. Uh, other key elements that are important when you're going outside and you're going into public is it is really important more now than ever to be buying Kleenex or to have a you know, a long time ago, everybody used to have these handkerchiefs. Um, You need something to sneeze into because you don't know when you've contracted the virus. There's nobody that got it unless they got it from somebody they knew for a fact was positive and lived in their home. Did they know for a fact that they were going to get it, right? And you don't know when those symptoms start and it takes a long time for the symptoms to start. It's, it, things are blooming. It's allergy season. We know that people are going to be sneezing and you know, at some point during the day, you're going to go out into the public and, you know, open a door, push an elevator button, and then your eye is going to itch. And you're going to think, God, I want to scratch my eye. I've touched things, so what do I do? So you take a Kleenex and you sneeze into a Kleenex. You use a a fresh, clean Kleenex. So if you sneeze into a Kleenex, throw it away. Don't keep it. Don't hang it out in your pocket. Um, if If you need to scratch your eye, itch your nose, all those gross, you know, human things that we do, um, do it with a clean Kleenex. Don't, 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 you know, think of, just be conscious of what you're doing. And if you're out and you don't have a Kleenex and you need to sneeze, do everyone a favor and sneeze into your elbow. Why, why should I sneeze at you into You're my- less likely, okay, everybody naturally, <laughs> prior to this t- point in history, normally would just sneeze into your hand, right? That's your natural, like, that's you. Touch your face, okay. On your hands. And you have to get into your car or open a door um, and it's on your hands. So what do you have to do? Now you have to get to a bathroom. Let's say you're in a public place. You're going to have to touch a door to get into the bathroom. So now you've left a virus potentially on the door before you even got a chance to wash your hands. This thing lives on things like brass and, and stainless steel for three days. 
So if you went in there on Monday and then your best friend goes in on Wednesday, she can still catch it. So this is why you sneeze into your elbow because I don't know. I mean, you really got to be doing something funny to get the center of your elbow rubbing up in people's faces. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you're just less likely to transmit disease there. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show these results on this poll. Okay, so it's been seven minutes. Um, Michelle um, described what um, social distancing looks like. Dr. Roger, do you have any input on that before I give these results? I'm just waiting for the results. I'm excited to know. You re <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. I think somebody lying. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to admit it. <laughs> People in social networking <laughs> come up. No. <laughs> yes. Sometimes. You, like, how can New York? What's the percentage of um of the COVID vi um the virus uh, in New York, Michelle? There's forty five thousand cases right now. Okay. So I, right now, this someone's tell some stories. Okay. I told you, <laughs> I said we were gonna play. No. Everybody in New York, everybody in New York is definitely doing that now. If they were not doing it before, they are. I have a question for Dr. Rogers. So how can people, so we're talking about social distancing, okay? How can people implement social distancing that doesn't make them feel isolated, depressed, or anxious? One of the things that is being promoted by the state is the elbow bump <laughs> for people that you are close to. So that means family members within their own house. If you've got one adult that's leaving and going into the community and one that's staying in, when you get home instead of hugging before you've had a chance to go take a shower and, and be able to wash any potential virus off, it's an elbow bump. And it's kind of become a, like a funny joke amongst people because they're even standing six feet away and they're like, elbow bump, <laughs> you know? We, we're finding ways to find humor in it, right? Like you, you have to, to survive. But just to go out and take lawn chairs and six, sit, sit six feet apart, you know, have a glass of tea, chat. You can still talk. You can still be there. You just can't be in each other's faces. I'm like, I'm like Michelle. It's become an ongoing joke with friends at this point. Um, it's either the elbow bumps. It's the, you know, putting our ankles together, you know, the ankle kick that we do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that keeps you about, you know, four feet apart if you're already pretty tall. Um, you know, we've all, we've kind of gotten into this whole, you know, Asian bow thing. So we've kind of experimented with that, you know, so I think there are lots of ways to, you know, use humor, especially during this time to continue making relationships, you know, blossom. I mean, the fact that we can't touch each other. I mean, most of our, most of our behavior is nonverbal. And so there are lots of nonverbal cues that we get from each other, a smile, um, the way that you look at somebody's eyes, very, very deep. Um, so there, there are lots of things that we can do that don't necessarily lead to isolation, uh, but can also give assistance at the same time. Um, I think just kind of an important thing to touch on is that, uh, you know, there are a lot of services that are being, um, and there's a, in the state and the government is already doing a lot to open up a lot of those services. Um, people that are in Dr. Rogers' uh, health profession and psychiatry have been using telemedicine for quite some time. Telemedicine, just to be real clear, this is this right here could be a version of telemedicine. If Dr. Rogers wanted to charge us, um, you know, he he technically could use this platform for telemedicine. A phone call can also be telemedicine. So I think some people don't really understand what telemedicine is. It's just another way to communicate with a person without actually being in their house. Um, and the state of New York has already gone through and done several different mandates about, um, I mean, they've changed laws for home care. Uh, there no longer has to be a face-to-face -face, um, visit to qualify for home health. The primary care physicians have shut down their offices. They are not, no one is going in a doctor's office anymore. Um, surgeons are not doing follow-up visits anymore after surgery. So they've had to loosen the laws, and I would anticipate that Texas will also probably follow some of those as preemptive if you, as you guys have been to really kind of take charge, but to also get ahead of the crisis in the other way, which is the preventative method, uh, the preventative side of that, which is the mental health issues that come along with this, the access to healthcare without putting yourself at risk. There, there's just, there's a lot of laws that are changing right now to make it um, healthcare more accessible without physically having to be there. 
Uh, and I'm really excited. Actually, that's one of the, I think one of the most positive things that has come out of this because the cat's out of the bag. Good, good luck putting it back in. There's hotlines that are starting up all over the place uh, for people that are feeling isolated. Um, for, for elderly people that need, uh, that need help. And like I said, there's a lot of legislation changing to be able to allow people to get access to those, um, to those services. In Texas, Health, Health and Human Services actually a couple of weeks ago changed things so that we can actually do therapy by phone at this point, um, which we couldn't do in the past. Um, we can have telehealth visits with kind of similar to what we're doing, doing tonight. Um, so there are lots of ways that things have changed. And Michelle's absolutely right. I think as we move forward, um, it's going to be really hard to go back to the old way of doing things because people are going to be very locked into this is actually quite easy. Um, before this, I had a number of clients that I saw from South Carolina that they would basically meet me at lunchtime. They'd go out to their car. I'd sign on to the telemedicine platform and we'd have, you know, a 30 minute visit while they're sitting in their car at lunchtime. There was no driving time. There was no getting to the office waiting or anything. They knew at 12 o'clock we were going to be there. 12:30 they could go back in, and life was life was good. And um, I think we'll begin to see real shifts in the way that medicine is done and provided. Um, and telemedicine will actually, I think, have a bigger portion of what we're moving toward after this pandemic. Right now, with the elderly that are coming into the hospitals with the uh, weak immune system, they're no they're more prone um, to suffer from the coronavirus because their systems are because their immune systems are weak and so with the telehealth um with the telehealth being available um i think that it i think it will be better for the elderly i think that it'll be um a lot better for those not just the elderly those that suffer from low um low immune systems there are a number of apps that i've i've used used in the past that folks have liked and one of the things I can do is I can get a list of those for, for NIA to the post. Um, some I think are better for different kind of disorders. Some are better for anxiety, some are better for, for depression, but I can certainly share those. Um, I saw earlier somebody was asking about for free resources as well. Um, one of the things that's been very interesting around this is that most people, including a lot of people in offices, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, et cetera, have really stopped actually seeing people. And I think right now the medical system has kind of hit this pause button with everything except for COVID to try to figure out how do we get through this. But I think on the other end is where we'll start to see some of these other things like more, you know, group chats and those kind of things that will actually be um, very helpful. And one of the things we may actually want to consider, Nyetta, is do we actually host some kind of, you know, I wouldn't call it a group therapy session, but do you have something that allows people to, you know, deal with their anxieties a little bit more? And that's something we should probably talk about and think about whether we'd like to do as part of the help show. I think we should. Um, I know right now we are getting um, ready to do some, a couple of projects with um, um, with mental health, with, with, um, I'm not the college, with a certain college. And what we are doing um, we're doing the screening process um, with the college for the students and to figure out why the students are not um, attending the um, attending counseling. What I'm learning is that when, just because you, you receive a free service, um, you do the screening and you find out what the diagnosis is, the question is, why aren't people comfortable with um, with, with with going to a therapist, so I think telehealth would be a great source for people to feel feel more comfortable. Um, it's uh, privacy. Yeah. I it's um I think there's still a, a huge stigma when it comes to mental health, and uh, there's a lot of people that are scared to have other people know that they need resources. I'm looking at another question in the chat room, and one of the things that we, um, uh, another panelist or participant talked about is, um, you know, parents who need support uh, because they are being forced to stay at home with their kids. Um, they they have actually been forced to parent their children, and and they, and one of the the statistics, and this is true. I'm. Um, and the, 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 um, the participant said that there's, there's statistics are showing a huge rise in child abuse. 
Um, I, there's an attorney in New Jersey named Jan Bernstein and she does family law. She's very, very, um, very, very well respected in her field. And she, uh, I just called to see if she wanted to participate and I could barely get a hold of her. And she said, I would love to participate, but um, I do family law and my phone is ringing off the hook. Um, so, you know, um, I think being forced to stay with people that we might have had a mediocre relationship with, but we could get out of the home being <laughs> them for 24 hours, you know, if it bothered you a little bit, it's bothering you a lot right now. So not only are there more domestic disputes, but, but um, children as well. And I think that uh, telehealth is definitely one of those ways that we can reach out for those families to get support. And about the child abuse, you know, that's in my, and, and this is just an opinion and it's not my professional opinion, but um, people that lash out at children who are very small um, are, are taking anxieties and fears and frustrations out on something that really can't punch back. Um, and they need another outlet that, I mean, that, that in itself is a mental health issue that needs to be dealt so that they can learn to redirect that energy at something more positive than their, ch than their children. If you are starting to have that building anxiety, reach out early. Absolutely. There's enough telehealth and there, uh, there are apps. Um, and you can literally go onto Apple iTunes right now and just search, um, therapy apps and you'll get about 15 of them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot of options out there. Uh, go, go Google in your phone book and look for therapists because most therapists now are able to bill directly from their phone. So you can just pick one uh, and, and get visits. But it's much better to talk to somebody right now while you're starting to feel anxious, while you're starting to be frustrated with your, your children before you snap. Right. Um, and, and I think that's what's happening is people are not able to have the support system they normally have. But I do think, in my my personal opinion is that so telehealth is important but but being aware and educating yourself is for farmers first because just like you said oh you can go on google and you can um find a million psychologists and therapists but the question is are they great are they great at what they do are they fit for you you want to be able to find someone that's fit for you so it's finding the medication that you need um that if you have anxiety or depression and um or um, so if you have suicidal thoughts, you have to find the medication that suits you. So you have to find the therapist or the counselor or the social worker that best suits, that best sit, suits you. So before you say, oh, let me just Google, educate yourself. Educate yourself. And that actually is a very, a very good point, Nayada, because you know, every therapist is not for every, every person. Uh, if you're a good therapist, you should be able to connect with probably 90 plus percent of the people that you that, that walk through your door. Uh, but you're right. There are sometimes very specific things. Um, there are sometimes things that are look that people are looking for in a specific instance that they may not be able to find the therapist. And so it, it sometimes it may take two or three therapists before you find the person that really meets your meets your needs. And so that's not a not a bad thing to bad thing to do. What I'm going to do, um, I am going to open up our Q and A because we're like an hour and thirty. <laughs> so um, I'm going to allow um, who wants to ask the, ask the question to raise your hand. We're going to do this for ten minutes. That you know your children are going to react and follow verbal and nonverbal reactions. So it's very important that you let them know that you and your family are okay, and that children during this time are going to need a little more emotional support. Um, so, you know, to take some time during your day to actually give them a hug and say, you know, it's going to be okay. And I know you're a little frustrated and just really acknowledge their feeling, uh, their feelings. Small children have a really hard time with language. Um, and so uh, it, it might be a really good idea to print out a picture of emotions. You could even use emojis on your phone, like um, what, what is sad, what is happy, what is anxious, and, and just talk about being able to identify those emotions because smaller children definitely um, ha have trouble with that. So uh, the other thing is avoid excessive blaming during tensions. It's easy to get mad and why did you do that and you shouldn't whatever. Um, so just be, be mindful of that. And then one of the most important takeaways I can see here is limit television viewing. And I think that goes for, for adults as well. You know, don't, don't leave the social media and the television on just talking about how terrible this stuff is for, for 18 hours in your home. Okay. 
So the question from Malak is a friend asks what she should do about her teenage child who works at a grocery store that has not yet um, put protection in place for their employees. Should telling her child not to work or is there something the child can do to protect himself and continue working? I would, I would say, how, how old was her child? He's got a child, got a job. He's probably 16, 17, somewhere. I, I heard her say he was a teenager. Yeah. yeah. So, so I wouldn't necessarily say quit your job. Okay. Um, and that would, come, that would come from a couple of places. Um, one of the things that we want to really teach young people is to be responsible, learn how to work, do all those things that most of us did, did growing up. I worked at McDonald's for seven years of my life, and I learned as much from working at McDonald's as I probably have since then. Um, but I do think there are a number of things that, that he could do to protect himself, and this is where the conversation gets into with, with his employer. Um, the first one is, if I'm working in the grocery store, one of the first things I would do is really start by wearing gloves um, as I'm working. I'm touching lots of things all day. Other people are touching things. I want to definitely protect myself. And so I want to have pretty much gloves on at all times. So if you go into most restaurants now, you go into gas stations, you go into stores, you'll see people with, with gloves on. That's the first barrier that's there. The thing I'll say about gloves, you have to be very careful when you're putting them on, taking them off, um, to make sure you're not moving germs from one place to, to another. Um, but I would definitely take the gloves off on a fairly regular basis, at least once an hour. The second thing is practicing social distancing. So just because you're in a grocery store doesn't mean you can't stay, you know, six feet away from people. That's, that's still very, very possible. Um, as a matter of fact, I was with a young man earlier today who actually said, could you step back a little bit while I put your put put something in your car? Um, I was at, a, at another store. And so I think teaching kids to do some of those safe kinds of things that are good for COVID, but are also good in reality and life in general. So if we talk about coronaviruses, we have this particular coronavirus, but before this one, we had MERS, which was Middle Eastern. We had SARS. Um, that existed before this. So we've had a series of coronaviruses now that have shown up. Flu continues to be a very significant, significant virus. So I think there are some safety things that he should put in place, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily say stop, stop working because of it. Okay. It's a great time to talk to your, your teenagers and, and young adults about advocating for their needs as well. Absolutely. You know, I, I think, uh, trying times are great opportunities for teaching um, and and a situation like a teenager whose employer may not be as educated on what they need to be doing gives this this child an opportunity to speak up for himself and get his personal needs met which will travel with him for the rest of his life okay um i have another question from someone natasha murray um if she can answer would you like to answer your question live um Natasha, is she still on the line? Let me see. Yes, she is. Um, a lot of talk. Natasha? Um, my question was actually mentioned earlier, and I had the question about the child abuse. I'm alarmed, as I'm an educator, so I'm alarmed at the rate of child abuse uh, going up because students and parents are sheltered in place. And parents are, like I said, being forced to um, raise <laughs> their children. Mm -hmm. So as educators, we're charged to continue the teaching and learning process. And we are communicating with our parents. So I was concerned or questioning about what can we do to help our parents in these times as well. That link would be great to give to yeah, your colleagues. Uh, about how to talk to kids um, with the National Association that I was reading off of earlier. We can certainly send you the links to that and I really, really advocate to be able to pass it out to any teachers um, because you are close to the students and they will call if they, if they can to reach out for help because who, are they, who else are they going to reach out to help? They don't even see anyone in, in, any, anymore. Um, so just getting some of that information out to parents I think would, would do a lot of good. 
there, there was actually another question that I saw in the chat room from yes. Sophia. Okay, but you guys had to help me. Okay. It says, how long is a person potentially contagious after being exposed to a source of COVID-19? And if someone has recovered from COVID-19, <laughs> are they no longer a risk to others once their symptoms have resolved? You wanna take that, Michelle? Okay, um, so the active person, the marked fever is the most important piece. Once you've hit fever and you are fever free for 24 hours without, and this is a key part of this, without fever reducing medication, um, you are considered to no longer be contagious. So, okay, so if we, we have a couple of different, um, you have a presumptive positive, and then you have a confirmed positive. So a presumptive positive is 14 days. And in general, that's what we're seeing is 14 days for this, um, for this to take its course. Like I said, 82% of people are coming out fine. So we, we in the healthcare industry are saying that you're uh, resolving, you're self-resolving. Um, so if you have a presumptive positive, like you know somebody and maybe you were in contact with them, but it wasn't what we call direct contact, Direct contact is close supervision, meaning less, uh, three feet or less for more than 15 minutes with somebody who is um, COVID-19 positive, then we're asking that you isolate for 14 days. And as healthcare workers, we're all having to take our temperature every day and report it in before we go to work. So Dr. Rogers, I don't know if you guys are doing that yet, but if you're not, it's coming. Um, we have to take our temperature every day and report to our supervisors. Well, we can't get into work without taking our temperature. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so if I'm walking in the hospital door, um, at Parkland now, we have no visitors at the hospital. Every medical professional coming in has to have their temperature taken as they're, as they're coming in the door. So it really has been um, very, very close. And I think as we do more national testing, we're going to see more of those kinds of individuals that we're all coming into contact with, which is why, you know, social distancing becomes such a huge issue because the person may have no clue they're a carrier well guys it is 8 24 we went past our um <laughs> our, po our podcast webinar um if you guys have any questions please um email info info at the help show.org um also i have pretty much everyone's email address so what i will do um the information that we we've given you tonight i'll make sure i'll um, send that to you over the next week or so we will see a significant rise in those numbers because michelle was talking earlier um you begin to get this doubling effect um that you're going going to see and i think we're at that critical point now where that's that's starting to happen so one of the things that President Trump talked about was, you know, having churches be able to go back to service by Easter. Um, that's certainly something from a medical opinion we absolutely shouldn't do. There's nothing epidemiologically that says that that should, that should happen. So that's not going to, to be a good idea. If you look at what most of the medical schools are doing, really, which is probably where the best data is right now, they're advising that their students will actually be out of school for at least another month um, and really not starting to think about, you know, coming back to do anything before May. Um, more likely, it's probably going to be sometime into the summer at the earliest before we see enough of a slowdown for people to begin going back to the same spaces. But I think it's probably going to be significantly um, further out than that. But I my educated guess is the earliest we'd see something is probably June. I, I kind of agree, although I will say that Texas, I think, really took an advanced step by you guys starting this process which, with such low numbers. I think you're going to bend the curve a lot faster, uh, which, which is really important. Um, there's also a lot of uh, stuff going on right now with experimental medications, and they're starting to get some results. So. Uh, you know, you're, you're right, Dr. Rogers, we really don't know what the future holds. If we follow Wuhan's uh, process, it was eight weeks. Um, I, I think they were probably a little more aggressive with their, with their population about- A little more aggressive? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I saw pictures of people being carried off with like, you know, batons and, and being drug out of the, uh, being drug out of public. And it, we're, we're just not quite that strict about our, our social isolation uh, uh, and, and 
and being in place. But um, so I, I have hope that Texas is actually going to do a lot better than New York. And you know, let's let's um, let's hope that by the end of May, uh, we all get a nice summer vacation because we're going to need out we're going to need out of the house and and some new scenery by then. That's, that, I think that sounds about right. I, um, I, I, I'm still unsure, so I, I don't have a per, um, per projection about when we're going to be able to get back to a normalcy. So um, with that being said, thanks, everybody, for participating. It is bedtime for, for Avery. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Dr. Rogers, thank you so much for being my co-host. Michelle, thank you for being a guest tonight. I Thank really you. appreciate you and your knowledge. Um, we're going to probably have another coffee and conversation, but we're going to tighten it up a little bit differently. <laughs> this is our first. I loved it. It was on my birthday. Happy birthday to happy me. Happy birthday, birthday to you. I really happy, happy birthday. I want a song, but we'll, I'll let you go with that. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, thank you guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Hi, this is Nayetta, and you're listening to The Health Show. To The Health Show. And you're listening to The Health Show. And you're listening to The Health Show. And you're listening to The Health Show. The Helpline. Seek help when needed. If distress impacts activities of your daily life for several days or weeks, talk to your clergy member, counselor, or doctor, or contact SAMHSA. Help at one 800 985 5990. The crisis worker will work to ensure that you feel safe and help identify options and information about mental health services in your area. Your call is confidential and free. Crisis text line, text NAMI to 741-741. Connect with trained crisis counselor to receive free 24-7 crisis support via text message. This podcast is produced by Nayeta Reynolds, Ben Fenton, Nicole Smith, and Davian Abney Music. To get your very own custom beats, email Davian Abney Music at gmail.com. That's D A V I O N A B N E Y M U S I C at gmail.com. The Help Show is a nonprofit organization. To learn more or donate, please visit www.thehelpshow.org that's www.thehelpshow.org or you can also cash out money sign the help show to send your donation so that's the money sign in the help show to send your donation there's no donation too small every dollar we receive will strengthen our efforts if you'd like to donate 1500 or more and become a VIP sponsor, visit www.thehelpshow.org to review additional packages with more detail. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at The Help Show. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. Please leave comments. We want to know what you think. Thank you for listening, and please stay tuned.